Um, thank you all for coming. My name is Diane DiNapoli. I'm a Hingham resident and the former co-chair of the Hingham CPAC and the Hingham CARES member. And currently I'm the staff liaison to the Hingham Police. But most importantly, I am the mother of two children with special needs. I want to thank you all for coming to this presentation and give a little flow of how this night's going to work because it's a little unusual. Um, Dr. Murphy, who is a, earned his uh, doctorate degree from Northeastern, he is a teacher, a presenter, and runs his own consulting firm, which you can see, you can line on, log on here, Effective Effort Consulting. He's keenly aware of the social emotional needs of our children, and he is truly a wonderful person and a joy to work with. His energy and passion are just tr tr tremendous. Um, Dr. Murphy's presentation will run about half an hour and we can ask questions. I strongly encourage you if something, you know, this is a lot to cover in one night, so we'll be posting it, but please ask questions. Um, Dr. Murphy, I'd like to now uh, turn the table over to you. Floor over to you. Thank you so much. My, my intention was really simple, and that is to leave us with... Okay, is that better? Is to leave us asking the right questions and better questions, okay? So that we can leave here empowered to solve a very, very complex problem with a very, very fragile population, okay? So uh, that required uh, a tremendous many, many hours to try to fill what I needed to into a 30-minute presentation. So uh, this was hard. <laughs> this was the hardest presentation I've had to prepare for. Uh, so, um, and like Diane said, um, a little bit about me. So I run a private practice in the South Shore. Um, I do that as my, um, you know, side job in a, in a sense. I'm a full-time teacher uh, in Duxbury um, as a special ed teacher, 20 plus years. Uh, dealing with issues head on and then at night I go into the homes and work with parents I go into the homes work with kids on solving very complex needs related to ADHD and executive function deficits so I work on uh, so as you talk about this drug drug use and the substance abuse you, you're talking about looking at it at, at symptom right as you go through the continuum of special ed or or the umbrella of what risk factors are associated and where the problems can persist to the point where we're in crisis. So, um, sorry. Okay, uh, but I don't just come at this as a professional, right? So I come at this also as a parent. So I can't wait to end my part of the presentation and put, take off one hat and put on the other and do and really try to get out of this also as a parent committed vested and trying to solve the same problems that you are um, and quick overview so i'm going to really cover uh six frames in this we're going to look at substance use risk factors trends in substance use we're going to look at substance use disorder as it's operationally defined trends in special ed risk factors within special education and then proactive parent strategies, okay? By that point, we're gonna have a lot of questions, but then I'm gonna bring up the panel. And because these questions are gonna drive right down into what do we do in Hingham, okay? Uh, so, sorry for the delay with this. I'm not sure what's going on here. Um, substance use risk factors. There are three components to, when we think about substance use risk factors, there are three domains, one's family, One's individual, and one is peers. And when you think of family, think of the tree, right? Don't think of the child in this case, but think of the tree. And think of aspects related to, so we think of parenting drug, uh, parental drug use, favorable uh, factors as it relates to parents and drug use. You talk about marital conflicts being risk factors, family dysfunction, substance use among siblings. <clears throat> oh, that's so annoying, I'm sorry. I'm not a podium person, so I try to not be behind a podium. Prenatal exposure, negative life events, and poor parenting styles. Now, Poor parenting is, is really as it relates to operational definition of it, but poor parenting styles, and obviously all of these can be related to styles that may lead to 
or B, uh, possible risk factors. So harsh discipline, permissive discipline, lack of or inconsistent discipline, inadequate supervision or monitoring, child abuse, and maltreatment. Individual risk factors. So this is when we think about the child, right? And we think about your child, whoever you have in your head here today, early onset of aggressive or problem behaviors, difficult temperament, low mood, low self-esteem, sensation seeking, poor impulse control. Now, I'm just talking about risk factors in the general population, but you're thinking of your child who has special needs, and I'm not even there yet. Keep that in mind. Other individual risk factors. Poor grades, right, underachieving. Poor social skills and poor social problem-solving skills. Learning disabilities in relation to coexisting conditions. And cognitive impairments. All of these being possible risk factors. Now let's look at the peer groups. Deviant peer groups peer attitudes towards substance use, peers that use substance use, social adversity, right, and attending college. I thought it was just kind of different item on the list. So what are the trends? So I'm going to start to, OK, so as we look at like a risk factors overall, let's look at what the trends are showing on a national level. All right, we're going to go back to 2017, come back to last year. And what I try to pull out of the data is I try to pull out information that I, as a parent, would want to see that might be relevant to me today in Hingham. Okay, There's a lot of data to comb through. So I thought, as a quick snapshot, what can you take away? Marijuana continues to climb in its use. And this study was looked at eighth graders, 10th graders, and 12th graders on a national level. And marijuana continues to be, uh, continues to climb in its use. Vaping, it's the new delivery drug, it's the new delivery device. And it is climbing at a rapid rate. Inhalants, decreased on all grades except eighth graders. That should tr spark some questions as to why. Cigarette smoking continues to decline. And binge drinking had been on the decline, but has stopped declining. And you have a steady trend where you have 4% of eighth graders, 10% of 10th graders, and 17% of 12th graders engaging in binge drinking. Let's go back to 2017. <laughs> I like this study because perception matters. And this study looks at beliefs about harmfulness around certain drugs. This is, this is a long list, and you can't really see it from back there, so I blew it up for us. But what it shows is, you know, from what drugs, maybe do they fear the most, right? Which ones are they, they feel is most harmful, and which ones are least harmful? Marijuana being at the bottom of the list. What I find interesting is when you look at the 50% range, you have cocaine, narcotics in that list. But this is an interesting slide that should lead to uh, other questions around why. Wh wh why. Why aren't most of them up at the 70% range? Why are kids not afraid of these drugs? Clinically, how do you know your child may have a substance use disorder? And that's when you can do, so DSM-5 would um, you know, say this. <clears throat> you need two or more of the following conditions within a 12-month period. Often taken in large amounts than intended. 
unsuccessful effort to cut or control the use, cravings, failure to fulfill major role obligations, persistent social interpersonal problems, occupation, recreation activities are given up. You just stop doing what you love. Re re recurrent use in physically hazardous situations. I just think of driving. Continued use despite knowledge of having a concurrent physical or psychiatric problem that may be the result of that dependency. And then you have tolerance and withdrawal. Two or more factors within a 12-month period. You now have what you would clinically define as a substance use disorder. Now, let's look at special education and see what comparisons exist. One in five children across America have a learning and attentional issues. Keep in mind the intentional piece. We're going to come back to this. <clears throat> when you look at th uh, from uh, three-year-old to, to 21, you can see where the prevalence exists. Where 35% have a specific learning disability, 20% have a speech and language impairment, and then 30% other health impairments, and the percentage goes down from there. But that's not necessarily as interesting as when you think of coexisting conditions. A child with a learning disability is twice as likely as a member of the general population to suffer attention deficit disorder. So I don't like that other slide because it doesn't factor in coexisting conditions. Right? And it's the coexisting conditions that can lead to untreated children. Flip it, and you have one third of children diagnosed with ADHD have one or more of these coexist coexisting conditions. So when I talk about trends in ADHD, I don't see ADHD children, right? I see coexisting conditions untreated. Because in my practice, that's what I see all the time anyways. But it's nice to see that the research agrees with me. <clears throat> now, just to make it a little bit more complicated to think about the life of a child with special needs, and maybe they have a coexisting condition, so they're not just dealing with a learning disability, but they are struggling with attentional issues, self-regulation issues, can you imagine they also have developmental delay related to social and emotional interactions with their peers? I wonder why homework's so hard. 10-year-old ADHD operates at the maturity level of a 7-year-old, yet they pass the license test, they get a car, and the rest is history, but not so much. Risk factors relates to ADHD. This isn't drug-related, but it is worth sharing. Traffic, more likely to have traffic citations, more likely to get in a second car accident, and more likely to have your license suspended or revoked. Teens with ADHD more likely skip school, drop out, suspended, or have to repeat a year. Are you starting to make some connections between risk factors related to substance abuse and the data you're seeing here in relation to special ed? You should be, because there is correlation. This was a meta, this was a systemic review or meta-analysis of 27 longitudinal studies. I don't know, the people, the researchers in the room are like, whoa, because that's good, right? And the conclusion isn't too far off, which you may assume, but this is the conclusion, that there is evidence of increased risks 
of using nicotine, alcohol use disorder, marijuana use, marijuana use disorder, cocaine use, general illicit drug use. But I have to add a caveat here because, of course, ADHD isn't existing as itself. It's a typically, I would say, by default, treated as a coexisting condition. And in this case, this research study had to this isn't a fair study if you don't put in the caveat here, and that is must factor in coexisting conditions of conduct disorder and oppos oppositional defiant disorder, or or. <clears throat> now, this is a, a transition slide that's going to lead into what to do, right? But at the heart of it is you have... You, is, is, is you may have children that fall under this special education umbrella that inherently struggle with self-regulation of thought, of mood, and behavior. And therefore, find themselves searching and in states of dysregulation leading down risky behaviors and risky actions. Difficulty regulating their thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Now, to me as a practitioner out in the field, that hits me harder than anything. And I spend all of my energy on answering that problem right there <clears throat> and helping children develop regulation skills in thoughts, feelings, and emotions and behaviors. Because that is what starts to lead them and maintain their efforts in a positive and productive direction. Self-regulation deficit, maybe? This is the pod, Tide Pod Challenge. If you don't know what it is, just Google it on YouTube, and you'll catch up to where your kids are. Not whether or not they're doing it, they just know about it. Um, I did ask if this is happening in Hingham, and I heard that there's no evidence of it yet. <laughs> um, so they, they take type pod things and they put them in their mouth and they chew them, right? It's, and then they video record it and they post it. It's a, it's a thing to do. Um, yeah. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, I'm assuming that we're not going to get the answer up here by me, right? But I'm going to tell you clinically what the suggestions are that we do and get us framing out next steps with a clear idea of what best practices are. And then we're going to look at what's going on in Hingham and what to do in Hingham. OK? But out of all of the research and all of the evidence I was, I was piling through, I put this statement on the front because it, resonate, it should resonate with all parents that after school hours are the most dangerous time for tweens and teens to be on their own, right? So you start to let your mind kind of go to that time period and say, what, what can I do about that? Maybe the best place to start. So get involved is kind of a, a a, a summary of all of this. Get involved with your children's lives. Get involved, get involved, get involved, get involved. Yeah, but it's obtrusive. Yes. Get involved. Know their locations. Know their friends. Know their plans. I know. They're going to tell you it's obtrusive. Get out of my life. Right? Limit the time your child spends without adult supervision. Learn the technology your teen is using and use it. Right? I, for most of us, that's, that can be a pretty significant learning curve because it changes every day. But I'm not saying you need to be up on the newest app, right? But you should be involved. And you cannot parent the way you were parented. Okay, so think of how your parents parented you, and then don't do that. <laughs> okay, and then, and then say, what should I do? Because 
for one thing, your child should only be in their bedroom to do one thing, and that's sleep, if you want to start anywhere. Why? Because they can take every dark alley on the planet into their bedroom with them. And you couldn't do that when you were a kid. So you just think about how to drastically shift my perception of how to keep my child safe. I'll start to figure out what the answers are. <clears throat> that was an environmental change. Behavioral therapy and environmental changes to shape the behaviors of our children. Now, this is with or without special needs, OK? Right? But best practices that we should do, I don't care who your child is, these are best practices. And I'm adding to it because the best practices can't even keep up with the trends in technology and what's going on today. Maintain a daily, daily schedule. Know your child's schedule. If they don't have one, make one for them. And say, here's your schedule. I love you. <laughs> Keep distractions to a minimum. Now, I love that. But here's what that means. Right now, social media is louder than you are. OK? So when they have a decision to make, guess who they're not listening to in their ear? Mom and dad are not on their shoulder because the distractions in their life are louder than you are. So you have to find a way to become louder. And I'm not saying discipline. I'm just saying be present, be involved, be proactive, and be louder than the technology and the social media and the bombardment of being a teenager today. Provide logical space for your child to keep their school. Just help create structure in their life. Physical. Because have you ever seen a, 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 a messy room? Does it feel good? No. So children with special needs struggle all day long. And then they come home. And you need to provide evidence of where structure can exist, where therapeutic environments can exist, where they can find a way of just finding a place to decompress. And if they walk into a home that's as chaotic as the school life they live, you're just helping to perpetuate a belief cycle in their head that they are in total chaos. Provide, uh, um, set small and reachable goals. This has everything to do with expectations. If you want my first suggestion on how to be louder than them, my first suggestion is write down your expectations. Just have a, some kids just have a dialogue and you form it into a paragraph and then you have everybody sign it. it says, this is our expectations of you. This is, your, this is your expectations you have of us as parents. Now we have a roadmap. We have a clear defined set of rules of engagement of what we as your parents want for you as our child. Um, reward positive behavior. Uh, this is this is the opposite of nagging. Okay, so they use the word, you know, we know what nagging is. Nagging is when you chronically see something that you don't like and you just complain about it repeatedly until it changes. And when it doesn't change, obviously you have something called nagging. Changing that story by setting expectations and rules and daily schedules and really clear, defined plan for your child's day, you can start to create positive behavioral rewards that promote. Now, this is really just to help them break the cycle of negative self-thought, negative self-identity, and to help them start to create positive life patterns. Um, charts and checklists. Checklists are awesome. Uh, limit choices. Uh, in a society where there is limitless choices, it is not a bad idea to just simplify their life, right? And start to really quiet and calm the choices that they have in front of them. They don't have to do everything. Find positive activities. This I hear as build their strengths. Find what they're good at. Find what they're passionate about. Right? 
Dr. Um, uh, Hallowell would call it uh, cognitive strengths. It's their innate interests and start to expand upon them. In the chaos of being a child with special needs and the struggles, nobody lets them know what they're good at. Everybody lets them know what they're not good at. And then they get the grades to prove it. And they have the nagging parents to prove it. Focus on what they're good at. And give them a roadmap towards building that strength into a career. And the hardest one of all is stay calm and consistent. It's hard. But if you start at the top and work your way down, by the time you get to the bottom, it's actually easier. Because you've done a lot of other things right, so you're not constantly berserko. Yeah. I, I took a, a couple of statements from the earlier slide that I've, uh, but to reiterate, <clears throat> their striving instincts is that cognitive strength. It's that innate ability. What are they good at? Now, I see too many kids forced through the educational systems, and they should be at a Vogue school. You know why they should be at a Vogue school? Because they're amazing with their hands. And everybody thinks they need to graduate from a regular high school. Guess who lost out and is still searching for what they're good at? Right? So pay attention to what they're good at. And don't project your identity on them. Let them decide. Let them be the voice and follow, listen to where their strengths are. Be their suggestions and start to let them move in a direction that truly defines what they're capable of. Or else they'll continue to define with what they're not capable of. Mirror traits, hard to do. But if you can catch the moments when you're nagging, that's the moment to say, what am I nagging about? And is this a trait that I can start to define positively? OK. Oh, yeah, an example. So well, three would be you know, stubbornness, right? It's, it's a great example because we think of stubbornness. And from a cognitive perspective, it's known as you know, rigidity. I want things my way, right? And if I don't get it my way, I'm going to have an adult temper tantrum. I'm talking about the kid, right? Parent, kid, right? Parent, kids. Yeah, so, so the kid will have a, a, a temper tantrum because they didn't get their way because of this rigidity, this stubbornness. Now, I see that as a gift. If it's harnessed and moved in a purposeful direction towards something they're really interested in, right? Because that stubbornness may make a phenomenal entrepreneur that will never give up on their passion, but not if they're treated as being just stubborn, and that's negative because you're not doing what I told you to do. Um, create opportunities for connectiveness. Just try. I don't care if it's once a week family dinners because you went from none. If you can get to five, you're a rock star family. I have families that do breakfast because nobody's around at night, and they get together every morning for breakfast. Just as hard, because someone has to get up early to make it, right? <laughs> trips, trips without technology, trips without distractions, make that part of the new you. So, I have no idea what time it is. OK, so I covered, so like I said, I, it was a lot of information. I tried to put in what was going to be relevant to this talk to get you all thinking. And I know I threw a lot at you on a Thursday night at 7.30, right? I expected that. It's online for you to go back to. And I expect you to do that as well. But I want to now get the, the panel, the people in town, the experts in town, Chief Olson, to start to, <laughs> you just got the buck passed here, <laughs> to, to share with you what you can start to listen for. As parents, you're walking through the day of being a parent. What do you listen for? 
What are the terms that you could start to, you know, that you may not even know exist? Now, you saw that list of, of, of 25 drugs. Well, they all have about 25 different street names that change every day. So this list isn't really that helpful, except to get us starting to think about what do I listen for? And I would refer to, obviously, the community officers to say, this is what I'm hearing. And then what to look for. Do we have my, uh, oh yeah, there it is, okay, cool. So I'm walking into the bathroom at Duxbury High School, and I see this. I waited 10 seconds while he held his breath. <laughs> now, if, if you're not, if, if you don't know what that is, you don't know what just happened, right? And this is the larger of the versions of, uh, of, what, a va you know, of, of what they vape with. So they can hold, they can conceal that tight and then their wrist and it drops down, they're in their pocket in two seconds. But they're fearless about it because it is so easy to conceal. Right? And as you noticed, it's bottom of the list. I mean, if they're, if, 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 uh, you know, if they're using it for nicotine, if they're using it for marijuana, you know, they, they'll figure out a way to do it. And they're not that, it's not a harmful substance from their perspective unless we start to change their belief. Right? <clears throat> so, what to look for in terms of the, paraphernalia, but also where is it hidden, right? I'm going to my buddy's house, and I have a backpack on. Why do you have a backpack on? Do you go to your buddy's house? Are you doing homework together? It's Friday night, <laughs> right? But, you know, you, you can just be involved. Uh, the obtrusiveness is 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 looking in their backpack. No, I don't, of course I trust you. I trust and verify. <laughs> it's the life of a teacher. We trust and verify. 